Thank you, thank you. All right, how are people feeling? Great. Great, yeah. So before we start, let me ask you two things. Who here has attended talks on API security? Raise your hand. Yeah, quite a few of you. Who here has attended talks on uh, supply chain attacks, vulnerable dependencies, so on? Yeah, a little bit more of you, right? <laughs> That's bomb, yeah. Uh, there is a, a third type of vulnerability that I'm going to talk today, which is exec commands or command injections that I think is very important. So with that said, welcome to a quick story of security pitfalls with exec commands in software integrations. Uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Lena Alevsky. I'm from Mexico. I'm currently uh, working as a security engineer for Google. I'm also an open source contributor. I have worked in small companies, big companies, everything in between, and I really love cybersecurity. So quick agenda for today. Uh, we're going to talk about software integrations, some of the common associated vulnerabilities on each one of those categories. We're going to discuss a couple of case studies. Then we're going to talk about uh, one of my CBEs that I reported last year. And finally, we're going to discuss a couple of low-hanging fruits on how to exploit this and also how to mitigate and reduce risk. But before we start, let me tell you the usual uh, disclaimer. So the opinion expressed uh, in this presentation are my own. They do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the organizer or my employees or future employees. And all this is uh, uh, with uh, learning and educational purposes and to enhance cybersecurity awareness. With that said, uh, probably we are here agree whether if you are just starting to write your first line or code and you are an experienced developer, that code that doesn't touch anything else, like any external platform system, is not very useful, right? In order for code to be useful, it needs to have some type of integration uh, to any other platforms. These integrations are usually in the form of libraries and code dependencies, mean you are importing other people's code into your programs. But you can also do through calling external services, meaning you are executing other people's APIs through a channel. It can be the network. Uh, and also, you can do the, what is called like exec system calls, with meaning you are executing uh, programs in your same uh, process namespace. So each one of these uh, categories of integrations has some associated pitfalls and vulnerabilities. For example, when we talk about libraries and dependencies, uh, we may think about vulnerable dependencies, right? We may think about uh, dependency confusion attacks, uh, famous supply chain attacks, type of squatting, uh, misconfigurations. Here is your solar wing attacks, right? Like very famous supply chain attack, log4j. Here you have your national state actors trying to take over GitHub repositories, hoping to inject malware in those dependencies, and so on, right? On the other hand, when you integrate software by calling APIs or calling external services, more probably your thread model change towards data validation and sanitization. You take care about the integrity and the authenticity of the package being sent. Uh, you, are, uh, you care about data security in transit and all the encryption and data privacy. One of the most common issues for this type of integration is, for example, a misconfigured S3 bucket in which somebody push a lot of information and is publicly available and anybody can, can exploit it, right? Another thing is that if you expose systems to the internet, somebody can grow like web scrapers, uh, like in these scenarios, and they can like extract all the data. And most, pro most uh, famous, there is uh, similar to the Capital One data breach that happened, right? The third type of vulnerability will be associated with common injection, most probably. We, here we are talking about privilege escalation, vulnerabilities in file systems, and IPC vulnerabilities. Here you have uh, Equifax that I'm pretty sure everybody knows because it was a massive data breach impacting over 800 million uh, customers or users around the world. And also, more recently, we have the Microsoft Exchange server vulnerability that ultimately was a common injection and impact around uh, 80,000 companies, organizations around the world. So for the rest of the presentation, this type of vulnerability that we are going to focus on, we are going to do a deep dive into fundamentally how these 
uh, may be exploited in some scenarios. And looking for, for, for you, I have a fresh CV that I submit last year in a popular uh, open source software that ultimately allow you to take over um, an infrastructure and, and all the platforms being managed through that software. And it was high criticality. So we are going to do a deep dive into how, how that analysis works, how the exploitation works. But before doing that, let me tell you about the motivation before, behind this research. So as probably of you are already um, familiar to, um, who here is a fan of home labs or they do some kind of home labs, right? I think home labs are very cool. They are a very, they are a great way to experiment and learn hacking and learn new techniques. And my current mess is most probably a bunch of, uh, has a bunch of virtual machines, a bunch of bare metal or physical machines. It has a couple of cloud instances. Uh, so I have a little bit of everything. So as the home lab grows, uh, yes, yeah, <laughs> approved, yeah. So I have a, a bunch of a uh, little bit of everything, right? So I needed a way to manage all of this mess. So I tried multiple tools. Eventually, I, I have to learn Ansible, a very popular uh, management, automation management tool. And Ansible is amazing, right? Because it allows you to control multiple machines through uh, a thing called the playbooks. And the playbooks allow you to set um, a bunch of instructions that will allow you to update, delete, uh, install software in all your machines, right? So as the home lab grows, uh, it's getting uh, more and more difficult to, to do this kind of management because sometimes I'm not in my command line, right? Sometimes I, I'm traveling or I just have access to my phone or so on. So I start thinking that there should be a better way to do this, right? I start doing some investigation, think about uh, popular open source software. And eventually I found a very cool product, open source called Ansible, uh, called Semaphore UI, right? So Semaphore UI is amazing. It allows you to uh, integrate with all these automation tools, including Ansible. And on paper, Semaphore UI looks great, right? If we could have a diagram like this in our minds, uh, it allows you to do all the Ansible operations through a nice UI. Uh, you can have all your playbooks being pulled from a repository, so everything can be versioned. You have auditability, governance, multi-party authorization out of the box. And the best part for me is that it allowed me to reuse all my scripts that I already have, right? So as I was saying, uh, it was amazing. It had an integration with Ansible, so everything looks good. However, we are hackers here, right? We want to understand how this thing works, how the integrations work. And this is the main focus on the talk. Like at some point I start thinking how this UI integrates with Ansible, how the commands run. So I start doing a, like a code review, manual code review. The, the project is, is in Golang, a programming language I'm familiar with. And I start reading at the code until I found that the way they call the Ansible playbook is by using an uh, exec command, right? Which is a way, a system, a way in which you call other programs using the system calls. So I realized, like, this is dangerous, right? This is a problem. So I continue reading the code. The developers, they, they I, I'm assuming they may or may not be aware about this was a bad idea. They try to hard code the binary to try to limit the arbitrary command execution. But if I'm honest with you, I didn't feel comfortable running this in my infrastructure, right? I don't want to expose it to the internet. I don't want other people to mess up with, with my environment. So I decided to continue investigating more, right? So I entered the realm of Ansible security. So if you are not familiar with Ansible security, now it's a good chance. So there is a cool website that I highly recommend you to bookmark that is called GTFO Beans. GTFO Beans is amazing because it has a huge repository of binaries that exist on the Linux operating system that can be abused to elevate your privileges or exploit some aspect of security of systems, including Ansible Playbook. So right out of the box, I have two examples of how, to, how can I pop up a shell by running a malicious playbook, right? And also how, to, how can I elevate my privileges? So, uh, 
it's a very cool website, book market. You can go, you can look not only for Ansible, you can look for many other binaries. And if you are a Windows person, there is also a Windows version for this, right? Called LOLBAS, which is exactly the same. So armed with this knowledge, I start creating my own malicious playbooks to do more experimentation, right? So as I was saying, it's possible by uh, running an, a malicious playbooks to get an interactive shell. So anybody that run the Ansible playbook command and then pass this uh, playbook will get a shell. Similar to that, uh, you can do a server-side request forgery, um, and basically you will turn that machine unit uh, running Ansible into a proxy. What about reading sensitive content and sensitive files? You can do all of this through Ansible as well, right? And this works uh, this way like by design because this may be a legitimate operation that you want to do with automation, right? And finally, we have the most common example, which is how to, how to get a reverse shell. Like if you have a Netcat listener and then you execute this playbook on a machine, you are gonna get a reverse shell. So you get the idea. So it seems that the most dangerous thing is arbitrary malicious playbooks, right? Lucky for us, the whole Semaphore UI model takes this into consideration and we can divide and we can have two types of users. One, an admin user, high privilege user, is the one that is gonna be pushing the playbooks into a Git version control, like everything can be authorized, auditing, very secure. And then we can have a regular user that is the one that is gonna be just running authorized playbooks, is not gonna be messing up with anything, just clicking a button to, for example, loop that packages, right? Um, however, if you go and remember the line of code with the vulnerability, there is still two more arguments that are basically untrusted input coming from a potential malicious user. So I start thinking, can a malicious user, can a low privileged user do something with that type of access? So in the UI, there is a part uh, in the platform that directly relates to these two arguments, right? This feature is called the extra variable feature. And this is also part of how Ansible playbook works, right? By passing extra variable feature, you are able to influence the way uh, an existing playbook behaves. And this is very useful when you want to customize certain host names, certain users, certain values. Uh, usually these extra variables are defined in a key value format, but also support JSON and YAML or, or files and so on. What they don't tell you in the documentation, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you can pass what it calls plugins. So these plugins are very similar to a server-side template injection attack that will allow you to basically pat, pass some command that will get evaluated and then uh, the result is gonna be included in the playbook, right? And this can be like some, some malicious playbook. And just to be clear, this is not, um, even if it's not documented in Ansible, this is not like a vulnerability in Ansible, right? This is how it works by design. This is a vulnerability on Semaphore UI, the, the layer on top. So armed with this knowledge, I went and refactored all my malicious playbooks, and now I, come, I came with malicious extra variables, right? So this is great because now a regular user, a low privilege user, can start doing all these uh, dangerous, potential dangerous things, such as uh, retrieving environment variables, right? Environment variables usually contain uh, sensitive data, such as encryption tokens, cookies, uh, API stuff, right? That then you can use to uh, laterally move, to move laterally, right? You can also do the server-side request forgery attack, which is great for direct filtration and extract secrets from, from a particular machine. Uh, but then there was a caveat that I found, right? In order for an extra variable to be executed, it first need to exist on the playbook. That was a challenge that I found. However, Ansible, Ansible documentation is great, by the way, if there is any Ansible maintainer. Uh, so there is a set of global variables that they, they will be always present regardless of the type of playbook. So if you define your malicious playbook by using any of those, that will guarantee you that you will uh, execute your malicious code, right? So in order for you to trust me, now I'm gonna show you 
a quick reversal demo. Oh, no, the demo gods. I mean, if I have a backup, this is the backup of the backup, by the way. <laughs> no. Let me. Okay, I can come back to this later. But the idea is that um, you have a, you have Ansible, you have Semaphore UI, and then a regular user can uh, use uh, can execute. Let me uh, go back very quickly. Let me see. There it is. This is the, the tier backup. It's in YouTube. But uh, the idea is, yeah, you have your Netcat listener listening. You have a, a low privilege user running a couple of authorized playbook with a malicious um, extra variable. Whenever they update that, this is a playbook that will use update system packages, right? Uh, at runtime, the variables are going to be replaced with the playbook with a malicious uh, payload, and then you are going to pop up a reverse shell, right? And from there, you can do way more advanced things, such as, um, you know, like lateral movement and uh, stealing secret backdoors, uh, stuff like that. So with that, let's continue. So what happened? By taking advantage of this vulnerability, as I was mentioning, a malicious user could escalate privileges. They can gain control of the host and potentially all the other machines uh, being managed by Semaphore UI, right? Which is pretty, pretty, pretty dangerous. So now let's put on the, the red teamer hat, right? And let's think about how can we exploit similar examples, right? Like whenever you try to do an assessment, Let's imagine we are trying to review this piece of code. Let's think everything that can go wrong about this. So the first thing is, if you are able to inject an arbitrary command, that's common injection out of the box, right? You can run anything that you want. It will, it will be executed with the same level of privilege as the program running this function. Uh, if you are able to control the arguments, or the environment variables, that will help you to influence uh, how this program uh, behaves, right? How this execute. Then if you are able to control the execution folder, that also may give you some intended access to somewhere in the system. Next, uh, if you are able to control what the input that the software is passing to that binary, that may also be interesting to see if you can exploit that, that binary, that integration, and finally, most of the time, these, these commands being executed through exec system calls will produce some type of output that may contain some sensitive data, right? Some tokens, cookies, things that should be remain private, right? And you don't want uh, users messing around with that. Um, the good thing is that most popular programming languages have native APIs to do these exec system calls. Doesn't matter the programming language, you can, there is a way for you to call other programs, and as long as this is like this, like developers will, uh, will do it, right? So besides the traditional dynamic testing and fuzzing testing, what I recommend uh, for you to kind of do this type of analysis is to do thread modeling, right? Understand at a fundamental level uh, what are the different components that are integrated um, and how that uh, impacts the security, right? The security aspect. Uh, 
I, I, I always recommend to read the documents. Maybe there is a flag, there is an argument that you can use to abuse the platform, abuse the system. And uh, there is uh, a lot of interesting files, right? Files and flags. So now let's remove that hat and then put the hat of the blue team, right? How, to, how do we defend for this? How do we uh, mitigate the risk? So the first thing that I'm gonna tell you is if you have to, if you are starting from scratch and you have to do an integration, you just prefer any other method, right? This is probably the worst method to integrate programs. Uh, if you don't have a, uh, if you cannot do that because of legacy reasons, because maybe you are dealing with a binary or a program that doesn't have an API or doesn't have an SDK, then the next thing you have to do is same team as the red teamer you have to really understand fundamentally what is the threat model for this, how do we impact the security of, of the overall platform, of the overall uh, uh, program. While you are doing that, always uh, follow the, the least privilege principle, meaning a sandbox execution of the, of, the, of the binary, like drop privileges, try to uh, drop out uh, capabilities, you can also complement this with a bunch of, a couple of static analysis code tools. And while you uh, found all the places in your program that is doing this system call, these exec commands, make sure to always uh, sanitize the input, right? And if possible, use uh, a low list so people doesn't pass like arbitrary arguments, arbitrary commands. As I was also mentioning, read the documentation, be aware of those dangerous flags. Uh, security training for your developers is very important, but the most important part that I want the takeaway is that this is a continuous process, right? You have to do this, uh, this analysis for every integration that you bring into, into your system, right? Into your platform. So today we talk about the different ways of software integrations, the common pitfalls and vulnerabilities associated with them. Uh, we discuss a couple of uh, famous case studies, like more like data breaches. Uh, we, we did a deep dive analysis into the CBE on Semaphore UI and what was the impact. We did some uh, low hanging fruits, uh, exploitation analysis and mitigation risk. And with that, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we are open for questions in case we have time, I think. Yeah, we have two minutes. So. I think if anybody has a question, there is a mic over there. Oh, perfect. Uh, fantastic talk. I really appreciate it. Uh, what was the painful part of your research from the time of discovering that uh, they're using uh, Ansible in the background? And what prompted you to start digging deeper into uh, mm -hmm. the project? And what was very painful in that process? <laughs> Yeah, so I will say the most challenging part was um, like to run Semaphore UI, it was very easy, right? It was just a container. I can deploy it on Kubernetes or any other container runtime. Being able to set up the development environment was kind of challenging. I spent a couple of times, uh, a couple of um, days trying to get the tools and the right versions and libraries until uh, I saw that they use what is called dev containers that basically simplify the development uh, process a lot. So that was one of the things that I learned. And then um, to kind of exploiting the vulnerability and find it, it was a couple of, uh, because I didn't do that like full time. It was like across like a couple of weekends until I have like a proof of concept and then I, I responsible disclose it with the team and they patch it and, and they assign the CV. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for, for the question. Thank you. Yeah.